Okay, hopefully I've grabbed your attention with that little compilation. We're actually in my office though for this one in the old office. Makes a change at least from the kitchen, doesn't it? And today I wanna to talk to you about what I do if I was overweight again. Well, first things first, I'd be really freaking annoyed, right? All the work that I've put in over the last couple of years, I wouldn't wanna wake up one day and be overweight again, have to do it all over again, right? But that's not the point of this video. The purpose of this video is to give you my blueprint my plan, knowing what I now know after fixing this stuff over the last couple of years, and hopefully you can take the lessons, the tips, the hacks that I'm about to share with you in this video, inject that stuff into your own health strategy going forward and see better results than ever before. So with that said, here is step number one. I'd of course start by picking my chosen diet methodology. And the first concept that I'd remind myself of here is that losing body fat is far more about nutrition than exercise. We are going to talk about exercise today, but especially when it comes with starting from scratch, right? The bulk of your results is going to come from fixing your nutrition practices. It's far more easy to get yourself in that calorie deficit by eating cleanly than it is by eating a bunch of junk food and compensating with a load of exercise. Now, in terms of which particular approach I take, you already know what I'm going to say here if you've been following me for some time. But truth be told, there are many ways to peel an orange. They're not all equal. I don't think they're all as effective or as uh, advisable, but there are many ways to peel an orange. You need to pick the best one for you. How do you know what the best approach is for you when it comes to losing a bit of weight? Well, you've got to ask yourself, what could I actually sustain, right? What could I stick to? What's practical for my lifestyle, the sorts of foods I enjoy eating anyway? That is obviously going to make the most sense. Also consider, final point here, Will this approach help me lose weight? Yeah, obviously. Would it also help me get healthier, right? Because there's a lot of approaches out there that don't necessarily improve your health. Now, by default, you're going to probably lower risk factors for major chronic disease simply by losing body fat, regardless of which particular approach you take. But at the same time, there's clearly objectively healthier ways to do it. So you've got to ask yourself, yeah, what's going to help me lose weight? What's the one I can sustain? But also, what's actually a healthy way to do it? Because you could eat pop tarts, right? That wouldn't be Ryan Adams' recommendation. Okay. So, of course, you guys at this stage, a plant-based diet is what changed. So, obviously, I would stick with that. Why would I change that now, right? I'm onto a winning formula. It's been amazing for me. And a plant-based diet makes it easy in my opinion, to be in a calorie deficit, as you'll see here on the screen, because number one, many plant foods have a, an incredibly high fiber content, and fiber is really incredible for helping you stay full for longer. So you get so much fullness from those fiber-rich plant foods, and therefore it almost feels like you're cheating weight loss, because that story that weight loss needs to be the restricting, um, restrictive, excuse me, depriving experience where you're hungry all the time, well, that goes out the window the moment that you do it with a high fiber approach, I argue. And number two, the second reason why a plant-based diet makes it so much easier to be in a calorie deficit is because many plant foods, not all of them, but many plant foods have a very low calorie density. In other words, you get lots of volume, lots of bulk in your food without actually consuming that many calories. And you can see why, you can imagine why that's amazing from a weight loss perspective, because you could put together these very generous bowls and plates of food, big old portions, when you actually count up the calories, wow, compared to fruit meals or bowls of food that have lots of animal products in, certainly lots of processed foods, quite obviously, well, the bang for your buck that you get, the volume to calorie ratio is absolutely incredible. So for me, a plant-based diet was so easy to be in a deficit and therefore on the back end lose weight because of those things. Now, obviously, that's what I'm going to recommend here. That's what I talk about here is the benefits of following a plant-based diet. Once again, it absolutely changed my life. But I'm not going to judge you if you choose a different path, right? I'm pretty staunch on this. I think this is amazing for me, and I think this is amazing for everyone. And I am staunch on that. But I'm not going to be hyper judgmental about it. That doesn't serve anyone. It doesn't serve my message. So whatever you choose to do, if you see things slightly differently to me, fair enough. What I do suggest, and what I'm sure you can get on board with, is that you should be eating as many whole foods as possible, right? In the brackets there on the screen, you'll see over 90% of your diet, 90 or above percent of your diet. 
focused on whole foods. Why? Because they are harder to overeat. They have this incredible self-limiting factor. So yes, I argue you should do it through a plant-based methodology. I don't agree with the keto guys. I don't agree with the carnivore you know, diet guys on many things at all. What we do all agree on though, across the diet spectrum, is that whole foods are packed with the most nutrients. They have a lower caloric density than many processed foods on the whole. They aren't messed around with, they tend not to have all the chemicals, the additives and the other nasties thrown in. So yeah, number one, they're harder to overeat. Number two, quite obviously, they are healthier and more natural. Step number two then, once I'd established what methodology I was gonna follow in terms of diet, once I then realized the importance of eating whole foods and why they should make up the vast majority of my meals, I'd understand that there is a bit of wiggle room here for processed foods, right? I'd still have some processed foods, maybe around 10% of my diet coming from these. And it's worth saying as well, processed foods aren't automatically all bad, right? Many of them are, let's be realistic about this, but they're not all automatically bad. It is a case by case thing, right? Some, as you'll see on the second bullet here, some have lots of fiber still intact, even though they've been processed, and they still have a relatively low calorie density. And this is important as well, they give us more options. If we were just eating whole foods, we'd be kind of limited. It's kind of hard to stick to a strictly whole foods only diet, right? In this artificial age, you rely on, you know, maybe you even have a little bit of stevia. Well, technically that's processed. You put some stevia on your whole foods, that's technically processed, right? Or white rice, which is perfectly healthy for you. Well, it's technically processed, right? Part of the grain is removed and therefore it's processed. You wouldn't get very far if you were strictly only eating whole foods, makes sense? So having these healthier, let's say, more intact processed foods, give us more options so we don't get as bored with just a very Puritan approach. So things like, you'll see things like this in my diet, you know, in these videos, right? And I'm going to talk about them today, but whole wheat and rye bread, you know, they're a far cry away from, you know, most of the, the white bread products that you see, you know, in your local grocery store. Whole wheat, lentil, pea or bean pastas or brown rice pasta, uh, corn pasta as well is another good pasta option. There are even healthy cereals, would you believe? Things like bran flakes or shredded wheat-like products. They could be really part of a, a really decent staple in a healthy and weight loss encouraging diet, right? These things are not just automatically bad, okay? Purely because they're processed. I've put noodles here, but specifically, I mean things like buckwheat soba noodles, brown rice noodles that you can do in your healthy stir fries, etc., etc. So that's step number two. I'd still have some processed foods, but they'd make up around 10% of my diet. Whole foods are where it's at. But as for the really heavily processed, refined stuff, you know, the sweet treats and, and fizzy drinks and sodas and whatnot, they'd be gone. They'd be banned. Of course, I would leave some margin forever and error, excuse me, knowing that I'm a human being, knowing that I get cravings, knowing that I'll be at par or every now and again out and about, even if this was a, a really strict sort of um, refocused phase, something would come up at some point and I'd give in, I'd give in to temptation because goodness forbid, wow, what a shot, I'm human. But, you know, these cleaner processed foods, these could, these could absolutely be worked into my diet. But the other stuff, you know, especially like the, you know, on the subject of plant-based eating, right, right, the heavily processed sort of vegan alternatives and the mock meats and whatnot, many of these are, are simply not good for you and are not weight loss friendly either. Step number three, I'd walk 8,000 steps per day. Now, ultimately, there is no magic number here, right? A lot of people say 10K steps a day, and I'm just saying something slightly contrarian or, or something, the same theme, but slightly different, 8,000 steps a day. That's not your magic number. It's not as though if you do 7,999 steps per day and then sit down that you're not gonna lose fat, right, that day in that 24 hour period. That's obviously not how it works. This is just a target and it is slightly arbitrary, but here's where I've landed on it. This is my methodology for me anyway. 8,000 is more achievable for me than 10,000, the, the commonly advised 10,000 steps a day, because I've just recently in the last couple of months moved out of my city and it's a little bit harder. I have to drive places now and I still do a bit of walking and I still go into the city very often. I do some walking there and there'll be many days where I'll check my step counter app and I'm over 10,000 steps easily in many cases. But 8,000 is a far more realistic target for me. It fits my lifestyle very well, but it's still a good challenge. Like that's still quite a lot of walking actually. Actually, that's still a good amount. It's not like I'm letting myself off the hook by saying only 5,000 steps, for example, which might be a reasonable challenge for you. But again, this video is about what I would do, knowing me, knowing what I need to get back on track. And 8,000 steps per day seems to be a really good sweet spot for me between an amount of exercise, an amount of movement, 
that actually really supplements weight loss very nicely and aids me in getting in that calorie deficit. But it's not too much to where I'd have to be so focused and motivated to do it every single day. And I get in 10, 11 days of doing it and I just think, oh, I don't think I can do these 10,000 steps per day forever, right? And get demoralized and burnt out from it. And the great thing about walking, rest assured, we're going to talk about other exercises in, in just a, literally the next slide here, so just a second. But the great thing about walking from a weight loss perspective, and this is why it's so underrated for losing body fat, is that it doesn't spike appetite like more intense exercise does. And in fact, studies show that the same amount of calories burned, uh, excuse me, yeah, no, that is correct. The same amount of calories burned through walking versus things of a greater intensity, let's say, for example, like running, swimming, um, cycling, the, you can burn the same amount of calories in an exercise session. So you take your walking session and then you take your, let's say, running session, equalize them so you burn the same amount of calories. Well, the walking will spike your appetite way less. So if you're somebody that notices as soon as you start to push yourself with the exercise that your appetite becomes uncontrollable, and ironically, even though you're doing all this exercise, your diet actually gets worse. You actually see yourself sliding back up the scale, even though you're doing all this exercise and it doesn't make sense. This, this could be the reason why, is because you're getting these huge appetite spikes several times throughout the week, and they're lasting a while as well because you're doing such intense exercise. So walking allows you to burn those calories without your appetite skyrocketing in exactly the same way. And just a little caveat here, just because an exercise increases your appetite, that doesn't mean you should avoid it. That's not what I'm saying. But for a lot of people that are new to this weight loss game, it's very risky to suddenly start doing lots of intense exercise that, that puts them at risk of, of their appetite flying through the roof because they're not quite sure how to manage, control that, and how to, let's say, uh, split test that with their results on the scale. That's sort of more intermediate or advanced stage that you learn how to manage all that stuff. Step number four, I said we'd talk about other forms of exercise. I would personally do very brief, when I say brief, we're talking 15 to 20 minutes, or that's how I start anyway, strength training sessions two times per week, which is not a huge commitment, right? I would not be a gym rat. I'd not be a fitness freak. I wouldn't be in that gym every single day. In fact, as I say here in the first bullet, nothing fancy. I wouldn't even need a gym membership necessarily, okay? It could just be body weight movements that I do at home, like squats and lunges and push-ups, these fundamentals of body weight and strength training. Maybe I'd even grab some resistance bands like I have a lot of my clients do. They can be brilliant. Uh, and then you don't have to get a whole set of dumbbells in your house or anything like that. And you can take them with you. When I, whenever I travel, I take resistance bands with me. That's a quick hack as well for staying in shape on the road. So nothing fancy, just two of these sessions per week. And you've got a whole world on YouTube of free resources here, right? For workouts and exercise tutorials and form tips. That's actually how I learned back in the day when I was like 18, 19, 20 and getting in the gym for the first time. I just watched YouTube, YouTube videos. I never actually personally, I had, this is, I had friends that were personal trainers. So that was a bit of a cheat code. But what I was about to say is I never actually personally worked with a personal trainer, but I had gym buddies that were and they knew what they were doing. So that helped, admittedly. But actually the bulk of my knowledge on how to actually train your muscles, how to strength train correctly with safe and proper form that actually stimulates muscle growth. Um, that was all from YouTube, from free stuff on YouTube. Okay, I didn't have any programs for this back in the day. So yeah, this would be a great supplement to the walking. Now, more intense forms of cardio, as I spoke about in the previous slide, like running, swimming, cycling, martial arts. I love my tennis, as you guys know, team sports, so on and so forth. These are still great as well. Yoga, Pilates, slightly more steady state. These are still fantastic as well. You can do those, but... I am thinking about a plan here that I can easily stick to, that I'm likely to stick to, a plan whereby I'm not as fit as I am today, not to sound arrogant, but I'm not as fit as I am today, and so I want to start slowly and not risk injury and not put too much on my plate, pardon the pun, from an exercise perspective. And so this suits me just fine. 8,000 steps a day, a little bit of strength training, and sure, Maybe in time, I'll get involved in some more intense cardio like I like to do nowadays. But this is exactly how I'd start. And this is more than enough to lose weight. Remember, back to that previous you know, slide, several slides back, actually. I think it was the first one. Step number one. I would, uh, and it was the first bullet point. Let me find it, actually. Let's go back to it. The first bullet point here on that slide. Understand that losing body fat is more about nutrition than exercise. So there's some exercise tips. And this is my routine. This is what my routine would look like. But I'd also understand that the main focus for me, the biggest fire that I'd want to put out is that nutrition stuff. Step five, let's talk about an actual meal plan here then. 
how does all that stuff I was talking about earlier with plant-based eating and this sort of North Star of shooting for like 90% whole foods, how does that actually break down? What does that actually look like in terms of my meals? Well, breakfast for me at the moment, this is perfect. This is exactly what I do tomorrow because this is exactly what I'm going to do tomorrow, regardless of what weight I'm at. I'm loving this right now. I'm back on the oatmeal train. For years, you guys know I was loving my cereal bowls for the last couple of years. But when I first actually adopted a plant-based diet, I was having oatmeal pretty much every day for the first couple of years of being plant-based. And I'm back on that party. I'm back on that party bus, right? I'm back on that train. So right now, I'm loving rolled oats, unsweetened almond milk, cooked in unsweetened almond milk with a one-to-one ratio. Some people like to have it a little bit more creamy. I don't. One-to-one ratio. Uh, berries, you can see in the photo here, I've got blueberries. Uh, milled flax seeds, uh, alternatively chia seeds, hemp seed as well, but I'm loving my flax seeds at the moment. And admittedly, I've got this massive bag of them to get through, so there's no point uh, varying it up too much at the moment. And then a touch of maple syrup or stevia, which I'm, I'm totally okay with stevia. Maple syrup is pretty calorific, so I'm not super liberal with it. I wouldn't be in this case if I was trying to slim down super liberal with it, but a little bit of maple syrup to bring that sweetness. The photo you're seeing here, by the way, there, those are some pomegranate seeds, which I haven't included on my list here, but they're a nice little addition. And there's other stuff you can do, like pomegranate seeds here, and adding cacao nibs, and some people like banana slices on their oatmeal, etc. There's so many, that's what I love about oatmeal, there are so many variations. You can throw nut butters in there. Again, you want to be careful with that from a weight loss perspective, because nut butter, as I'm sure you know, is so calorific. But point being, like this is, th these are versatile, right? These oatmeal bowls are really, really versatile. Point two here, most dieters find oats really effective for weight loss because of how, how filling they are. Again, shout out to the fiber content of many plant foods, right? Oats are amazing. And this is, you know, oatmeal is one of those foods that across, with very few exceptions, across the nutrition spectrum, people are in, are in agreement that oats are just fantastic for you from both a weight loss and more widely a health and well-being perspective. So fantastic way to start the day i love these but just a couple of alternatives if that doesn't really take your fancy muesli bowls right my muesli bowls you guys know i throw some bran flakes in there again you can have the same toppings like berry banana so on and so forth a bit of unsweet plant milk touch of sweetener there to give it some delicious flavor flavor excuse me tofu scramble which i showed you in uh, i think my most recent uh, recipe video on my channel here breakfast smoothies and i i stress breakfast smoothies you know, these have to be hearty. This can't just be a little fruit smoothie that is 150 calories worth that just tied you over as a little snack between meals. This has to be more substantial. So maybe there does have to be some nut butter in there as well as fruit. Of course, there does have to be some nut butter in there, maybe some oats in there that I throw in my smoothies. And again, I showed you a smoothie in that that most recent recipe video on my channel, so you can check that out. Step number six then, what would my lunches look like? There's a theme here. I'm gonna use the word simple and I'm gonna use the word easy a lot. If you're new to my channel, you're, you're, you'll be hearing this from me for the first time, obviously, because you're new to my channel. Longer term subscribers, you know these are buzzwords for me, right? Simple bowls for my lunches, consisting of rice or another similar grain, for example, quinoa, beans or tofu, and yes, I'm totally okay with soy products, various veggies, so a mix here, as you can see in the photo, this is kind of like a burrito bowl style dish, various veggies, a healthy fat sauce, such as a little bit of avocado or hummus that has tahini in it, tahini being sesame seed paste, uh, maybe a cashew style dressing as well, again, for some healthy fats. And then a little bit of, I, mean, it depends, I, might, I might not need this, but I tend to like a little bit of hot sauce, a little bit of sriracha, a little bit of fresh salsa on there to bring it all together. And again, like I said with the oatmeal, these are versatile, right? This is a simple bowl that you can have lots of different combinations with. You've got black beans here, but you can easily do pinto beans or chickpeas or the tofu, like I say, so on and so forth. So this is a versatile little lunch, and I love these. And I work for myself, right? So working from home, I can do a cooked meal at lunch. Maybe that's not so suitable for you. Um, so a couple of workarounds here, as you'll see on bullet point number two here, you could even substitute the rice for a whole wheat tortilla wrap. So you wrap that up in some foil or put it in some Tupperware and then take that with you for the day. But other alternatives would include a hummus and veggie sandwich, which is one of the popular things that my clients love. Uh, vegetable sushi, you know, sushi rolls with avocado and cucumber and other vegetables in. And then some edamame on the side for a little bit of protein, a little bit of extra fat. And um, yeah, these are, again, simple. That's the theme here. Dinners, again, big shot. It's going to be simple, a little bit more complicated, but um, generally it's going to be very simple. Now, I want to stress here that the, the meal that I'm about to walk you through, my loaded salad meal, you'll see my 
lovely, very fetching photo there. Look at those big old mashes on the screen. And uh, me, what am I there with my uh, loaded salad bowl from a couple of videos back, if I remember correctly. And, um, you know, this is this is a great meal for me. But for many people, this is typically a lunch option, actually. But I would have this for dinner because I noticed years ago about myself, if I'm in a weight loss phase, I love having salad in the evening because I can just throw so many low calorie veggies in that salad and I can eat that dinner at 7, 7.30 p.m. once I've finished my work for the day. Um, and then that lasts me until I fall asleep at 10, 10.30, 10 11 p.m. at night. That lasts me really nicely. Whereas if, if I was having the burrito bowl, do I achieve the same, you know, even if they're equalized in terms of calories, that I haven't quite got the same volume. Look, the burrito bowl is a is a lovely high volume dish, fiber rich filling dish as well. But these loaded salads, I, I don't know if, you know, you can necessarily gauge the, the scale of, of the, the glass dish that I've got in my hand in this photo here on the screen. But it's huge. And I fill that thing up to the brim. And I'm just eating salad for ages sometimes. So when I'm in a weight loss phase, I like my salads in the evening, even though salads is typically a lunch for folks. This is, again, my plan. This is what I'd do if I was starting from scratch tomorrow and I wanted to lose weight. What I'd do is have salad in the evening. It makes it so much easier for me to not think about dessert or want a little sweet treat after dinner. So what would that loaded salad look like? Again, covered in one of my recent videos, but we're having leafy greens such as romaine and arugula or just mixed lettuce. Um, tomatoes, I'd probably do cherry tomatoes. I love the taste of cherry tomatoes so much better than just regular fine tomatoes, I find. But cherry tomatoes, chop them up, throw them in. A bit of cucumber, maybe a quarter or so of a cucumber. A bell pepper or maybe half a, a bell pepper. Then a cup or so, maybe a little bit more for me, of cooked quinoa, barley, some other grain that goes nicely in a salad. People often ask me, can I put rice in my salad? You can. I think it's a little bit weird. I think there are grains that taste better, but yeah, of course, whatever, whatever floats your boat, right? Rice would be fine. But quinoa, barley, buckwheat's another good option. Then I'd do my um, plant protein sauce. So I'd either have tofu again, or maybe in this case, in the photo, I've got chickpeas, and our chickpeas go really nicely in salads. There aren't that many beans, admittedly, that go taste go really deliciously in salads. Um, red kidney beans are okay, but chickpeas go really, really nicely in salads. And then I just do a very simple dressing. And in this case, I've given you here on the screen a tahini lemon dressing. So write this down or, or take a, a photo of, of this point on the screen, folks. Um, you know, that's one tablespoon of tahini there, two tablespoons of lemon juice, two tablespoons of water. It's a really basic salad dressing. You can add stuff to it. It's not the most fancy thing in the world, but it does the job for me. You can add stuff like miso paste to it. And maybe various other things too, or, or put a bit of vinegar in there and make it more of a vinaigrette, and, and that'll mix things up, or maybe a little bit of nutritional yeast, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know, or onion powder, garlic powder. You could do all sorts, right? But as as a, a just a, a quick throw together, such an easy dressing. And you can see the YouTube video that I'll link down below for for another dressing that I actually used on a loaded salad that I filmed on a video recently. It's it's not a tahini based dressing, it's more of a vinaigrette, so there's another option too. But if you don't fancy the salads for dinner, I don't blame you. That's just a hack that I've noticed in terms of fullness. It's incredible for me to have at night. But alternatives would be, you know, if you've been following me for a while, I love my tofu stir fry dishes, lentil bolognese or marinara with the whole wheat pasta, maybe something like a burrito roll like you saw with the lunch option. These are great dinner options. Snacks then, I, feel, I should have mentioned this earlier, really. it doesn't really make sense at this point, but I would follow a standard, if you didn't get the gist of going through breakfast, lunches, and dinners, I would follow a standard three times meal uh, structure, just a typical three meal structure, breakfast, lunch, dinner. There's a lot of talk about smaller, uh, more regular meals, benefiting metabolism. I don't put too much stock in those things. As you'll see on the second bullet point here, I, you know, I don't have um, a set eating or a fasting window times a day where I can and can't eat. And, uh, you know, even though I like a, a three meal structure, I'm not opposed to you guys, for example, doing a, a smaller meals five times in the day, because and the reason why I'm not opposed to it wouldn't work for me. The reason why I'm not opposed to it is because what matters most of all for weight loss is that you're in a calorie deficit at the, at the end of every day. How you get there is largely preferential down to you. And you might be able to argue that some secondary factors will allow you to lose a little bit more fat every day. But generally speaking, this comes down to preference. This can come down to preference. I would personally follow a three meal structure. But between those meals, I would have snacks. And I'd have unlimited, pretty much, and let me explain that caveat in just a second, but unlimited, pretty much, berries or melon for snacks. Now, generally speaking, fresh fruit is an incredible snack. 
is it has a high water content, so therefore it provides lots of volume for very few calories. Okay, so fresh fruit, and I'm highlighting, I'm emphasizing fresh fruit because dried fruit is the opposite. It's very calorific because it's got the water extracted, obviously. But fresh fruit is freaking amazing, frankly, for weight loss, excuse my language, but it is, just to put emphasis on it, to sound dramatic. Um, it is freaking amazing for weight loss. But berries and melon, and maybe even closely followed by citrus fruits, they're worth a mention here. Not that anyone's gonna eat lemons, but let's say the oranges, right, kiwis too. These are incredible for weight loss. These are particularly standout in terms of their calorie density. So I would just munch on berries. If I ever got genuinely hungry, right? And I'm not talking about the kind of hunger where you're stressed and uh, at work and you want to run into the vending machine to soothe, right? Or you have an argument with your partner and you're like, oh, give me something to eat. I'm overwhelmed. Or you're bored watching some Netflix at night. And this is usually when you eat chocolate or ice cream or some cookies, right? So you just want something to eat. I'm talking about when you can actually you know, easier said than done to deal with those things. But I've covered that stuff in different videos, right? We're not doing that today, otherwise this would be hours long. But, you know, for um, for those moments where you assess, you can ascertain that yeah, I'm, I'm genuinely hungry here, right? There's a, signs of physical hunger being a growling of the stomach, actual hunger pangs, um, a, a slow build up to the hunger as well. A sign that you're emotionally hungry rather than physically hungry is that it comes on fast. But a sign that you're actually physically hungry and should listen to that instinct is that it builds slowly over time. Uh, another sign of physical hunger is that you don't discriminate about which foods you eat versus when it's a very emotional craving, you're really specific. Now I need chocolate or I want pizza. There's something particularly on your mind. When you're physically hungry, you'll pretty much eat anything because you're actually physically hungry and your body's like, hey, we need some energy here in layperson terms, calories, right? We need some nutrients, okay? So snacks, you know, berries and melon, and maybe citrus fruits as well, these are incredible. And you can eat them to such a great degree because to such a large quantity and not worry about going out of your calorie deficit every day because of their, their low calorie content. Now that doesn't literally, you can see this huge half a watermelon piece, uh, you know, on the screen here. That doesn't mean if you have that every single day on top of your meals that you would definitely lose weight. I can't guarantee that. But these are lower risk snacks, let's say, than other snack options out there, most certainly. So berries, melon. So yeah, pretty much unlimited, you know, with the caveat of, you know, if I saw the scale going up and if I started running the numbers and realized I was having 800 calories worth of berries a day, which would be a small fortune in cost, by the way, but I was having 800 calories worth of berries every day, that, you know, then I'll, I would obviously reel that back in. But generally, you know, things like berry and melon, because they're high water content, and because they're not junky processed foods, right? They're relatively self-limiting uh, and low enough in calories to be low risk. So that would be my game plan with the snacking. And there'll be some days where I'd have one snack a day and some days where I might have three or four, I would try and listen to hunger, which I know feels risky for people, but you have to learn this stuff at some point. So you may as well get on with it and, and try and pick up on that intuition now. Step number nine, I treat myself, would you believe, to one meal out per week? I know, crazy, like right? wild, one whole meal out per week. No, but actually, you know, I'm saying that satirically. There's some people watching this, so I'll actually be shocked that I'd even let myself eat out once per week. But the reason why I would do this is uh, it wouldn't feel like a brutal sacrifice to me. And I've done periods where I've been so emotionally hurt and tied, hurt by my own lack of health results or hurt by my own disgust, frankly, for how my physique looked that I've been so focused on eating well that I haven't eaten out for months. I've had those periods in my life where I've not eaten out for three or four months. Um, I've done that. And now looking back in hindsight, that was over the top. And there were some ne negative ramifications of that in terms of my relationship with food down the line. So a reasonable compromise that offers some decent middle ground without risking I find the slippery slope is one meal out per week. And therefore, it wouldn't feel like some crazy sacrifice to me that felt totally unrealistic, that was just a means to an end. And then I, when I got to the finish line, I'd be like, well, how am I going to eat out again? How am I going to negotiate that? One meal out per week um, feels about right. And it's certainly not enough to ruin results, as you'll see on the second bullet here. Even if you have something quite unhealthy, it's not enough. You know, let's say, you know, 21 meals a week, three per day, 21 meals per week. Let's say you have one pizza. That's not enough to outweigh the fantastic work you did with those other 20 meals per week. It might stop you losing weight that day. It might take you out of your calorie deficit that day. But frankly, if you're in a decent enough of a calorie deficit, even going out for a meal that is a little bit more processed and it's a little more fatty and it's a little more rich than one of your typical meals from your plan, and maybe it's something I ran through today, 
that still isn't enough to stop your calorie deficit. So just to give you some reassurance on that, you know, it's a drop in the bucket of your overall weekly diet, even if you have something less than perfect. That said, I, I still, of course, wouldn't want it to be some ridiculous cheap meal, right? And I wouldn't want to be having appetizers and desserts and booze on the side as well. I'd just stick to an entree. And even if it was a little bit more processed, a little bit more oily, I'd be okay with it. And I'd try and make most of that dish. I'd try and pick something on the menu where, to where most of that dish was quite whole foodsy. And in, in the brackets, you'll see here, really great hack. This is particularly good when you're traveling is that sushi is always a really clean option. They don't use a lot of oil. There's not, not a lot of nasty stuff thrown in there. Of course, you've got some really elaborate fatty sushi. But usually, you can just get like a simple vegetable sushi, like I said earlier, on a side of edamame on the side. And you've had a dinner for like 500 calories, and you feel really, really full. And you might be thinking, oh, that's a lot of rice in sushi. But it's actually not. It's actually, depending on how many rolls you have, right? But it's actually not a huge amount overall. Um, but that's why I like the edamame on the side, because you've got your carbohydrate sauce, you've got a little bit of fat, maybe with the avocado, edamame's got a little bit of fat as well, maybe your dipping sauce, depending on what's in that. Um, but then with the edamame, you've got your protein as well there, not to be too cliched on that, but you've got your protein sauce as well on there. Like some people, they just go out for sushi and wonder why they're not satisfied. I'm like, because you've had a meal that's like 80, 90% carbohydrate, it's not quite balanced stuff. I'm a high carb guy, I don't have all that fear around carbohydrates, but 80%, 90%, is that going to lead to, to you know, in incredible satisfaction and all the nutrients you need? Perhaps not, arguably, perhaps not. And then step number 10, progress and tweaking, right? With this plan, the other nine steps I've run through, everything I've taken you through in this video today, as long as I was losing, now these are estimations for me. I'll come on to what might be suitable for you in just a second, but these are estimations for me. As long as I lost between 1.5 to 2.5 pounds per week, I would not track my calories. I just follow this plan and try and be reasonable with my portions, try and eat till I was full, but not totally stuffed, till I was satisfied, but I didn't feel sick. And as long as I lost 1.5 to 2.5 pounds per week, I wouldn't feel like I needed to track my calories. The scale would prove to me that I was in a deficit. How do you know if you're in a calorie deficit or not? Are you losing weight, right? That's the first telltale sign. However, if I hit a plateau or the scale went the opposite way that I wanted it to, despite me following this plan and actually eating very cleanly, quote unquote, I'd track my calories for a couple of days, maybe three or four, and I'd aim to trim a few calories off my daily diet to get things moving. I'd look at that data and I'd say, okay, I lose more calories than I was expecting to, you know, to bananas or to uh, brown rice or oh, hey, I have uh, a couple of servings of oats every single day. You know, that's that's like 700 calories. Maybe I could just bring that down to 500, for example, and fill the void with some more vegetables. A 200 calorie reduction is, is too aggressive, actually. I'm just I'm giving flippant examples here without thinking about it too much. But I would look at the biggest contributors to calories in my daily diet, and I'd see if there's any wiggle room. With them. But I'd, the point being, I would only actually look into the calorie data if the scale was giving me a reason to, if I was losing weight, because I don't like counting calories, it drives me nuts and I don't have my client count calories. I have a whole system to ensure that they're eating the right amount of calories. I'm not as laissez-faire with it as just saying, oh, don't worry about calories. That's not my belief. My belief is you need to be calorie conscious, even if you're eating healthily, otherwise you're not going to lose that much weight. But at the same time, I still wouldn't want to have to count calories every day and be really meticulous about it myself because it just used to drive me neurotic when I used to do that in the past. So... Instead, I would only track my calories or look into it if I had a reason to. And that reason would be either my results uh, uh, are not where I want them to be, or B, I don't feel well. I don't feel well and something doesn't feel amiss. Maybe that would be a sign that I was under eating, for example. And yes, I was in a calorie deficit because I was losing weight, but it was too much. So then I might track my calories and think, oh yeah, cool. This is great. This, this is validation. This is confirmation that I'm in a calorie deficit, but I've done it a bit too hardcore here. Maybe I can just add 100, 200 calories back in. I'll feel a little bit better and I might have a longer shot at this. It's a little bit healthier way to do it. And as you'll see on the final bullet point here, this is a really important understanding. Most people think the same calorie deficit amount will always work and it won't. Because as your body weight drops, unless your exercise goes through the roof the other way, unless you're really improving with your exercise, for most people, as for most dieters, as you lose weight, you have a, a, a lower BMR, basal metabolic rate. You need fewer calories at rest, basically, as you lose weight. And so that calorie deficit needs to move, ideally. You don't need to do it every day, but it needs to ideally move with your progress over time. Does that make sense? It, it kind of incrementally, let's say. So that's a huge mistake people make. They think, Oh, I, I lost 10 pounds a couple of months ago. 
my progress is totally plateaued, even though I'm doing all the same stuff, I'm doing exactly the same with exercise, I'm eating the same meals, Ryan, what's going on here? You're a lower weight, your body doesn't need as many calories, so that weight isn't budging anymore. Shave a few calories off your diet, you'll be amazed at how the scale gets moving. And that's it, a very simplistic, I think, plan with, yeah, clear rules and clear structure, and I am pretty firm um, on some of my boundaries, here that I've covered today and with my clients. But at the same time, there's no like crazy magic pills, I don't think here. I'm not telling you to stick to like a crazy eating window or that you have to do, you know, fasting periods or juicing or, oh, you must do high intensity exercise. I think this is a very reasonable strategy for people. I think that's why a plant-based diet has become so popular because there's a lot of people think, well, this is not only healthy, good for me, ethically really suitable as well, but also this feels like kind of like a a, a fairly effortless or as effortless a a way you can get to actually lose weight. And that's what I've found. It's totally changed my life. So hopefully the pointers and the tips and the lessons that I've shared here have been useful to you. But if you do want to go to that next level and actually guarantee that you get results from the information that you've heard today, I can personally coach you through this process step by step, as I've now done for over 400 men and women on my Slim and Sustain program. Click the link down below and fill out the form to learn more about the Slim and Sustain program. Thanks for your time.